Uh, thank you all so much for joining. So my name is Marina. I'm the webinar coordinator for Evidence Synthesis Ireland, and we're delighted to welcome you all to this exciting webinar on evidence synthesis in COVID-19. So just a brief introduction for those of you who may not know much about us. So ESI, which includes Cochrane Ireland, is an all-Ireland initiative funded by the Health Research Board and the Research and Development Division of the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Our aim is to build evidence synthesis knowledge awareness and capacity on the island of Ireland. We have a number of key activities for achieving that aim, and one of them is a monthly webinar on an evidence synthesis topic. So we have two presenters today, which we are delighted to have with us on the line, Dr. Kieran Walsh and Dr. Laura Comber from HICWA. So I will briefly introduce them before I hand over to start the webinar. Kieran Laura, and Laura are HTA research analysts with HICWA, based in the Cork and Dublin offices, respectively. Currently, they are working on the COVID-19 evidence synthesis team, developing evidence-based advice to inform policy questions from the National Public Health Emergency Team, NEFET, to support their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So Kieran completed a PhD in UCC on the topic of antipsychotic prescribing in people with dementia prior to joining HICWA in 2018. So Kieran is a qualified pharmacist and continues to practice in community pharmacy. So Laura is a physiotherapist by background and originally from Limerick. After completing her PhD in the area of falls in people with multiple sclerosis at UL, she went on to lecture in the School of Allied Health at UL before joining HICWA. So this webinar will discuss the experience of the HICWA COVID-19 evidence since this team. Uh, and HICWA develops evidence-based advice in response to the requests from NEFIT. The advice is informed by research evidence developed by the team with expert input from HICWA's COVID-19 expert advisory group, the EAG. So this process helps to ensure rapid access to the best available evidence relevant to the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak and is used to inform decision-making at each stage of the pandemic. So for this webinar, Kieran and Laura will focus on two recent policy questions posed by NEFET. The first related to the duration of self-isolation and the second in relation to restriction of movements. There are two key public health measures that are critical for controlling the pandemic. And this webinar will outline the steps involved in developing the evidence-based advice for an effort. So just before we start, to say that we've turned off video to ensure there's good sound quality for all our attendees. And we will have time for questions at the end. So we do encourage you to type in your questions in the Q&A box down below. Um, and hopefully you should be able to upvote on these questions as well. And just to say, we will make a recording of the presentation available on our website. So slides as well as a recording um, will be available on our website later today. Um, and we do encourage you to sign up to our newsletter and, um, and to visit our website. So that's all from me for now. Um, I'll hand over to Laura and Kieran. Um, thank you both so much again. Um, thank you. So thank you, Marina and Nikita, um, for inviting us here today to talk to you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, if you could let me know. Can you see my screen, Rina? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Kieran. Perfect. OK, so I, again, uh, thanks very much to ESI for inviting us here to talk to you today. Um, coll uh, my colleague Laura and I will be speaking on the HICWA experience of conducting evidence synthesis during the COVID-19 pandemic, with a focus on getting evidence into policy. So for today's webinar, uh, we will start off by discussing what HICWA is and what we do, our role in the COVID-19 pandemic, and the evidence synthesis processes um, we adopt, and then we'll discuss two examples. The first example um, of duration of infectiousness, and then Laura will discuss the second example, which about duration of restricted movements. And finally, we will discuss the challenges we've encountered, as well as the outputs and impact of our work. So just a bit about HICWA. So for those of you who don't know, the Health Information and Quality Authority is an independent statutory authority established to promote safety and quality in the provision of health and social care services for the benefit of the health and welfare of the public. Uh, we're responsible for a range of functions, including standards, regulation, health information, um, as well as um, health technology assessment. So it is HA that is the director that myself and Laura work in, and we're largely responsible for the uh, COVID-19 evidence synthesis response. 
So I suppose our remit um, comes from directly from the Health Act. Um, so it's a statutory remit. So this includes um, you know, uh, to, um, to evaluate the clinical and cost effectiveness of health technologies, including drugs, and provide advice arising out of the evaluation to the Minister and the education. We have a range of other kind of statutory uh, functions as well. Okay, so who exactly are we? So here we are, so there's 30, um, so there's 23 of us, and we come from a broad um, range of disciplines. So we have pharmacists, doctors, physiotherapists, statisticians, health economists, um, lab scientists, social scientists, just a huge range of, I suppose, of people. And I suppose speaking from experience, I've been there two years and I thoroughly enjoyed my time. It's a really collaborative environment. Um, I think we learn as much from each other as we do from reviewing the evidence. So a, a really kind of interdisciplinary um, work environment. So we have strong academic links, uh, specifically with RCSI and NUI Galway. We work directly with clinical and policy leaders and patient representatives. So for example, the HSE, Department of Health, academia and patients. We have grant funding from the Health Research Board. We host training and fellowship opportunities. So we currently have five uh, Sphere PhD scholars um, in our ranks. We host ESI fellowship opportunities, um, health economics interns, pharmacy placement, um, SPR and public health medicine. We also have strong international collaborations. So most recently with the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And we have an ongoing relationship with the European Network for Health Technology Assessment. So it's importantly, all our work directly informs policy and investment decisions. So um, our work would inform the national screening vaccination programmes, national clinical guidelines, strategies on cardiac services and antimicrobial resistance, with ionising radiation practices. And I suppose what we're here today to discuss is the national response to COVID-19. Okay, so I'm now going to discuss the HICWA's um, evidence synthesis team for the COVID-19 national response. So as we know, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact globally. Um, so it's estimated that over 60 million cases and over 1.5 million deaths have occurred, uh, and hence there's an urgent need for evidence-based policy and decision-making. However, this is challenging considering that, you know, in PubMed alone, as of two days ago, there's over 81,000 COVID-19 papers. So, I mean, there, there needs to be a system to kind of wade through that. Um, so since March, HICWA has conducted evidence synthesis to support the work of NEFID and associated groups and also has helped to inform development of public health guidance. So there have been two phases, um, I suppose, in terms of the evidence synthesis process that, that HICWA has adopted. The first phase was set up in March on an interim basis, I suppose, when there was an urgent need to get you know, information to the decision makers. And in general, the process is as follows. So the National Public Health Emergency Team will set a policy question. We in HICWA Evidence Synthesis Team will attempt to address that um, and we will uh, give our report to the NEFIT subcommittees. So these are generally the expert advisory groups um, and they will advise NEFIT. So that was the initial um, processes involved where we didn't directly advise NEFIT but we were kind of informing the groups that informed NEFIT if that makes sense. Uh, however this has changed since September so in line with government policy to uh, make uh, all of these functions um, informing the COVID response more sustainable um, a lot more responsibility has fallen to HICWA. So, so now we still get the policy question from NEFIT and we still conduct the evidence synthesis. However, this time we have our own um, HICWA COVID-19 expert advisory group and they provide expert in, um, input and expertise onto the support, uh, onto our reports. And then subsequently from taking into account all of the evidence as well as the expert opinion, we formulate advice for NEFIT. So the expert advisory group is made up of over 40 um, clinical, technical and patient experts um, from a broad kind of spectrum and they um, are a critical kind of part of um, our processes. So just in a bit more detail about the evidence synthesis methods, in general we're talking three to four weeks and sometimes this can be even shorter if there is an, an urgent need for an answer. So NEFIT um, give us a policy question which would be quite broad um, and from that, we kind of tweak that into a research question and we do a bit of scoping and see what kind of data we'll need and what kind of studies will, will help address that. We'll then, so there's a bit of back and forth, we'll develop a protocol and deliverables with agreeable agreed dates of delivery and so on. 
And I suppose our approach to synthesis can vary depending on the research question. So it can contain a combination of any of these. So it could be a review of international guidance to see what other countries are doing, review of the scientific literature, which I suppose would be the main part, but also analyzing existing data sources uh, where available and also some statistical modeling. Um, so from these, I suppose we collate all the evidence as appropriate, draft a report, and then we, we send it to the expert advice group for opinion and, and discussion. And so we host the meeting uh, at this point, and then uh, from, from that, we formulate advice to NEPIT. And at the end of the process, uh, I suppose our reports and all our support, supporting documents are published online in the interest of, of just transparency and openness. So to quote uh, Dr. Mike Ryan of the World Health Organization, speed trumps perfection. Perfection is the enemy of the good when it comes to emergency responses. And this really exemplifies our approach that we have adopted um, in the evidence since the team when dealing with COVID-19. Uh, there's a clear need for divergence from traditional systematic review methods. Uh, so we've all been involved in these traditional systematic reviews. They can take you know, over six, over 12 months, sometimes 15, 16 months. And although you know, they do provide absolute concrete answer and it's quite comprehensive, it doesn't necessarily meet um, policymakers' needs who generally ask for three to four weeks. And for them, that's quite a long period. <laughs> um, but yeah, so a rapid review approach is absolutely necessary in this regard. Um, inclusion of preference is actually something that um, we have uh, started to do. It's not something we would have done before, but in light of an ever uh, Joan, a rapidly evolving pandemic, it's absolutely critical to get information as soon as it's available and subject to caveat. And we have um, one of our colleagues, Barbara Klein, is writing a paper on sort of the perils and um, the benefits of using preprints. Um, public health guidance, as I said, it can give useful uh, information about what other countries, what our neighbours are up to. Um, again, it does have its own challenges. Um, but I suppose ultimately it's a broad and multi-dimensional evidence base that's required to address a lot of these research questions. And one thing I suppose we've all noticed is that you know, the, the, the gold standard RCT actually doesn't really address a lot of the research questions that we would be answering. In fact, it's, it's often the wrong study design. Um, um, so we would include anything from laboratory-based studies, environmental studies, um, your case reports even, you know, cohort studies, ecological studies, um, statistical modeling studies, a whole range depending on, on what's needed and, and what's suitable. So we do have a quality assurance process in place to ensure that although we are doing undertaking rapid review of methodology, so we are still uh, so producing a, a high quality output. Um, uh, within the time frame. And so we have things like led, each project is led by an experienced systematic reviewer, supported by a team of reviewers. There's a clear protocol and standard operating procedures that we follow. Um, so we have a good internal QA processes. So, so there's double checking and there's sign off by two senior members of the directorate. Um, and, and the input of the expert advice group is absolutely critical and, and provides that kind of extra lens, which is great. And I suppose ultimately, I mean, I have it in bold here, teamwork is absolutely essential. Like we have a pretty amazing team with so much different expertise and, and, and you know, so, I mean, there's a lot of collaboration going on, a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of, we have Jabber, it's instant messaging and you know, WhatsApping and stuff. So it, it's really, really you know, collaborative. It's all encompassing and it's all about getting the, you know, it's all about getting the product out there to a high quality to meet you know, um, the service users' needs. So we're going to move on to the two examples. Um, um, now, just to give some key definitions, um, some, some key public health definitions. So self-isolation or isolation, this is defined as separating those with symptoms of or diagnosed with COVID-19 or diagnosed with COVID-19 from people who are not infected. And restriction of movements are sometimes called quarantine is defined as separating and restricting the movements of people who are exposed or potentially exposed to COVID-19 and is performed as a precautionary measure to prevent transmission should exposed individuals later become diagnosed. So there are distinctions between the two with yourself know, isolating you're definitely infectious whereas restriction of movements you're possibly but unknown to become infectious. So both uh, key public health measures and critical in the fight against COVID-19. So I'm going to talk through the first example from start to finish, and this was conducted during the interim phases. So this is when we weren't directly um, uh, advising NEFIT, we were only uh, providing an evidence summary to the expert advisory group. 
And this is on the topic of duration of infectiousness. So again, just a reminder, um, this was the interim phase that was in place at the time. Um, and the policy question that we got from NEFIT was, does the evidence support the current 14 day period of self-isolation required for those that test positive for SARS-CoV-2? And kind of from that and doing a bit of scoping and back and forth, during the answerable question we felt was, what is the duration of infectiousness in those infected with SARS-CoV-2? And that's the virus that causes COVID-19. So again, from our scoping and our protocol, there was there was clearly two main study types or study designs that would, uh, with particular data that were useful for answering this research question. And the first one was virus culture studies. So these, of which we found 13, um, these determined the presence of viable virus by monitoring the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to replicate in lab-based cell culture. So although there's a lot of these in the literature, only you know, not that many actually have temporarily assessed them in relation to when people start to um, uh, develop symptoms and so on. Um, so these give an indication of when someone is is potentially um, still infectious if if you're if you're able to um, uh, replicate if you're able to grow virus um, in in cell culture at a particular time that indicates infectiousness. Kind of supplement that then we had contact tracing studies. So these um, well, observational studies, but these provide epidemiological evidence of transmission dynamics between index case and close contacts. And I suppose uh, when these are really well conducted ones that have really good information on on, on the temporal relationship, um, these provide Joe key, key uh, I suppose, evidence for duration of infectiousness. So I'm not going to go through the findings in too much detail, but I'll just go through um, the key findings. Um, and so what we have here is kind of three of the 13 viral culture studies. Um, they presented graphical estimates of the probability of culturing SARS-CoV-2 versus the number of days since symptom onset. So the days since, since, the days since symptom onset are on the bottom and the percentage culture positivity are on the left. And essentially the higher, um, you know, so percentage culture positivity, the more likely they are to be infectious. So I suppose um, these probability distributions are reproduced here with overlay curves to allow visual comparison of the probability results with the shaded areas uh, representing a 95% confident, confidence interval. And what we can see is that the probability of culturing positive virus declined rapidly after the first few days. And generally, um, it was generally under 5% uh, by day 10. Um, I suppose the key exception to this was Van Kampen, which is this green line here, and you see there's kind of like a prolonged tail, extended tail, and um, the probability of, of you know, positive culture fell below 5% only after 15 days. Um, and I suppose it's important to look at the population involved. So Van Kampen was noted to be to comprise solely of severely and critically ill patients. And it also included a large proportion of patients, so 23%, who were immunocompromised. So, and I suppose what's important is that the findings in these three studies were broadly in line with the remaining 10 studies. The other studies just didn't present and data that could be um, graphed, I suppose. Um, and I suppose generally the overall consensus was that um, uh, Joe virus was rarely cultured beyond day 10 uh, in mild to moderately ill patients, whereas in those with critical severe illness or immunocompromised, your prolonged culture positivity was observed. In terms of the contact tracing studies, of which we found two, and um, they both kind of came to the exact same consensus that um, although conducted in very different populations or different countries and so on, the when close contacts were first exposed beyond five days after symptom onset in the index case, no evidence of laboratory confirmed onward transmission was found. So I just have presented here a graph from one of the, the, the largest of the two contact tracing studies conducted in Taiwan, where they followed 100 COVID-19 cases. And among their, their over 2,000 close contacts, only 22 um, were infected, and all of whom were in contact with the index case within five days of symptom onset. So you can see here, they're all you know, below five. All the rest of their contacts did not become infected, but they only were in contact after day five of symptom onset. And when we, at the time of review, when we were looking internationally, or to see what public health guidance was like. So Irish recommendations at the time were 14 days with the last five days being fever free. And in, in internationally, there was generally large variation. It could be seven to 14 days, and often with different caveats on, 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 on things depending on the country. But we did note that guidance was frequently changing. Um, you know, we, we did note that you know, the World Health Organization, the CDC, Public Health England were kind of uh, 
we're moving towards a 10 day recommendation, um, having previously been different before that. And a CDC, I suppose, further specify that longer durations are required for immunocompromise required a test based approach to exit isolation. Um, so kind of considering all of these things, we developed our evidence summary, and this was specifically for the expert advisory group that were advising NEPIT. And our key conclusion really was that you know, patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 symptoms are unlikely to be infectious beyond 10 days. However, a limited number of studies indicate that patients with severe to critical symptoms and are those who are immunocompromised may be infectious for longer, essentially. So just to kind of put things into perspective, this is um, so this is as far as we got essentially in that particular role. The rest, I suppose, we were just bystanders in terms of how the NEFIT subcommittee may have advised NEFIT and how NEFIT would have accepted that those recommendations and so on. But ultimately, the policy decision uh, after all of this kind of process turned out to be that COVID-19 patients should self-isolate for a minimum of 10 days from the onset of symptoms, the last five days of which should be fever-free. So that kind of clinical uh, interpretation at the end about being fever free and the importance that it's attached that for clinicians. And I suppose importantly, how they kind of um, I suppose formulated the advice for that. So the advice was valid only for self -isolate, patients self isolating at home, and that it wasn't valid for uh, people in long term care uh, or those treated in the hospital. And the, and the advice for those patients remain, remains 14 days uh, with the last five days fever free. So that's 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 it from my end. I'm now going to hand you over to Laura. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, perfect. Thanks, Karen. Can you just confirm you can see my screen there, Karen? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Comer, and I suppose firstly, just to echo Karen's sentiments. And um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And um, so I'll be taking you through our second example of an evidence synthesis project. So this time around duration of restricted movements um, and this coming from the phase two processes of our COVID-19 work. So as a reminder of what that means, um, so phase two started around September um, and is our current phase that we're working in at the moment. So again, we receive a policy question from NEFIT and um, we work as a team to uh, build up an evidence synthesis around that policy question. We then draft reports on it and get an input from our HICWA COVID-19 EAG before formulating advice that we provide directly to uh, NEFIT. So I suppose with regards to the duration of restriction of movements, um, the approach really encompassed two separate policy questions. So one that led to the other, but all accumulating in advice around that duration of restricted movements. So the first policy question involved two um, rapid reviews. So one of the research evidence and one of international guidance, input from the HICWA COVID-19 AAG. And then the advice that was provided led to a second policy question. So this time looking at the potential impact of testing uh, for the duration of restricted movements. And again, through the HICWA COVID-19 AAG with their input, formulating our overall advice. Um, so with regards to the first policy question, so as it was received, it asked, does the evidence support the current 14 day period of restriction of movement for those exposed or potentially exposed to SARS-CoV-2? So I suppose within this, so when we're talking about exposed, we'd be thinking of close contacts of a COVID-19 case. Where we say potentially exposed, we'd be looking more at things like travel related exposure. So I suppose as a team, we came together and brainstormed what potential avenues we could look at to try and inform this policy question. And obviously there was lots we could have looked at, um, but we felt what best informed um, this question at the time was to look at the incubation period of COVID-19. So that being the time from exposure to when someone becomes symptomatic or the time to a first positive test. So as we know, obviously SARS-CoV-2 is associated with a large degree of asymptomatic infections as well. And to supplement that as well, we decided to look at the international public health guidance around restriction of movements. So as Kieran was saying, very important to look at what everyone else is doing, what's the kind of current state of play and what could be applied in Ireland. So as we started our scoping and reading around the topic, we realized that we were probably going to be faced with two types of studies, particularly for the incubation period. 
Um, so they, the first type of study was studies that involved reporting of a central tendency. So those being means or medians. And they're not very informative in isolation. So they're telling us about the average of the population. So particularly when we're thinking about duration or how long something is going to be, really want to know about the latter end of the population. So with that, we want to look at studies that involve some kind of a distribution. So those do tend to be more informative, but they are typically less common within the literature. But what they're doing is allowing us to figure out different time points that we're likely to see certain proportions of the population become symptomatic. And very importantly, they're allowing us to consider that tail. So overall, looking at this, we decided that we would use those studies of distribution within our main analysis, and then look at the studies of central tendency by estimating parameters for their distribution and seeing if they were in some way systematically different. So using them as a secondary analysis to add confidence to our results overall. So once I suppose we knew what we were going to be looking at, it was time to actually look at it. So in terms of our search, our screen and our full text review, we actually identified 98 studies that were relevant for inclusion. Um, so 96 of them, so the wide majority, were about incubation period and just three related to the asymptomatic populations. So they were kind of okay, so they were going to be a narrative synthesis. But in terms of dealing with 98 studies, obviously that's a huge amount and particularly within the time frame. So what we did here was a huge team effort and we actually dedicated five team members explicitly to this research question at the time. So working on the data extraction, the quality appraisal, and also ensuring that those quality assurance mechanisms were still in place. So with things like cross-checking and ensuring particularly for the incubation period that the data was being consistently extracted and could be easily analyzed. And while we were working on this, our chief scientist, Connor, was working up our analysis plan and getting that refined. So once we had our data extraction done, we were ready to analyze straight away. In terms of the overall findings, so just briefly to tell you what we found. Um, so that we found the median incubation period was between five and six days. At 14 days, approximately 95% of people will have become symptomatic, so with our current recommendation. So it estimates that about one in 20 will do so after that time. So we're capturing, obviously not everyone, but we're capturing the wide majority of people with the 14 days. If that's reduced to 10 days, we capture approximately 82 to 87% of people that will become symptomatic. So we can see a big drop here. So one in six will do so after that time. And if you go down to seven days, again, as we can see a considerable drop off again in terms of who we're identifying. So one in three people will be becoming symptomatic after the seven day period. In terms of the international guidance review then, so we looked at 26 countries or agencies. And generally what we found was in terms of close contacts, we were largely in line with what was being recommended in terms of the 14 days. Some countries had changed to 10 days, um, so specifically Norway, the Netherlands and Austria. But we did note a consistency that a negative test or a not detected test didn't affect the duration um, of the restricted movements or the quarantine period. So people were still being asked to maintain that duration for the 10 or 14 days. In terms of travel related exposure, so a little less consistency here. So at the time in Ireland, we had the green list. So people arriving from countries on the green list not have to restrict their movements, but anyone arriving from a country not on that list was asked to restrict their movements for 14 days. <clears throat> and what we found from looking at the international guidance was that most countries did include some kind of green list, although they weren't very consistent in what countries were included on those lists. Again, they varied between 10 and 14 days quarantine, depending, and also some included guidance around pre-departure testing or testing on arrival. And at the time, the European Commission had also put forward um, their common travel approach for consideration by member states, so that being the colour system that we've now seen adopted into practice. So I suppose taking the findings of our review on the incubation period and also the review of the international guidance, we convened the HICWA COVID-19 EAG for their input. And generally, the consensus was that the current evidence does support the ongoing use of the 14-day duration of restriction of movements. However, they also noted that further consideration should be given to the ECDC proposal. So this was actually published as we were undertaking this evidence synthesis, which says that the period of restricted restriction of movements could be reduced from the recommended 14 days if a PCR test taken on or after day 10 following last exposure to the case is negative. So that being not detected. So following on from our EAG meeting then, so we prepared our two reports for publication, so on the incubation period or time to our first positive test, 
and the review of international guidance. And then we formulated our formal advice for NEFIT, so in this publication here. In terms of the advice, the main parts are highlighted here. So in the context of no change to the current testing protocol, HICWA advises that the NEFIT retain the 14-day period of restriction of movements. And again, that further consideration should be given to the ECDC proposal. So that completed the advice formulation for policy question one. And naturally from the advice given, a second policy question emerged. So this time trying to look at the potential impact that testing could have on the overall duration of restriction of movements. So the policy question as it was asked was, is there a rationale upon which to reduce the current period of restricted movements for close contacts from 14 days? So to highlight here explicitly close contacts, so we're not looking at that travel related exposure. And if so, how will any change in guidance intersect with the current testing protocol? So that is a PCR test on day zero and a PCR test on day seven. So that's our current um, guidelines. And just to note here, whenever we're referring to day zero, it's typically not day zero since exposure. So unless it's the case of continual exposure or if you live with someone with COVID-19. So day zero usually represents the day on which they're identified as a close contact. So that may be three days or more since last exposure. So the research questions that we came up with as a team then to try and inform this policy question where what is the potential impact of different testing scenarios to reduce the duration of restriction of movements so i suppose when we look at that research question obviously potential impact and things like estimation doesn't really lend itself too easily to the research evidence so what we decided to employ here was a model to try and estimate some kind of outcomes for this question and we also said we better update the international public health guidance and um, review that we had done because it or even though it had only been about a week, um, that area is changing so rapidly. And um, so important to keep up to date with that. So again, just to flag, I suppose, where the policy question was kind of stemming from would have been that ECDC proposal. So again, that you could reduce the duration from 14 days if a PCR test taken on or after day 10 following last exposure was negative. So that being virus not detected. And this proposal was also caveated with a very important thing. So is that a residual risk will naturally remain and that may not be acceptable in certain circumstances. So I suppose when we're thinking about the model and how we structure it and what should be in it, our population of interest was quite clear. So it was close to contacts of our COVID-19 case. However, the outcomes of interest took a little bit of thinking. So we obviously wanted to include something around a benefit and burden and something around a risk. So in terms of benefit or burden, we looked at person days spent in restricted movements as our outcome. In terms of risk, we looked at person days of infectious individuals that may be back in the community having ended their restriction of movements early. Naturally, we also wanted to estimate the potential number of additional infections that this group may generate by re-entering the community and also an organizational outcome. So in terms of the number of tests that would need to be carried out. So some of the scenarios would be associated with an increase in the number of tests because more people become eligible for a second test that may not have previously been so. Our base case analysis was our current um, standard of practice in Ireland. So again, 14 days restriction of movements, PCR test on day zero and day seven, but you continue to restrict your movements even if not detected results is given. And then the various scenarios that we compared that with we're looking at RT-PCR tests or rapid antigen detection tests, which were having a growing level of interest, or a mixture of the both of the two of them. And also looking them at looking at them at various time points. So keeping the day zero test consistent, but altering between day seven and day 10 for the second test. And also that it would be an end of restriction of movements on receipt of a not detected test at that second point. So in terms of informing the model then, we obviously need to collect quite a range of parameters. So these included um, things like disease, person tests and organisational factors. So we obtained them from previous HICWA reviews, so such as the duration of infectious, uh, infectious sensor review that Kieran was talking about, the incubation period from the previous example, from the research evidence itself, from within Irish data sources where possible, and using approximation where it was required. And I suppose just to note, as Karen has said, we have an e a, a HICWA COVID-19 EAG who are standing members. However, when we need more expertise, we do look externally. So for example, with this question, um, we engage with colleagues from the contact management program, from the ESRI and from their behavioral uh, unit, um, and also 
some experts from the, with expertise in mathematical modeling. So in terms of the disease factors then, um, so this infographic at the bottom is just um, showing the parameters that were included in the model for an average COVID-19 case. In terms of person factors, we're looking at things like the average number of close contacts that a person will have, how likely they are to present for testing and things like that. For test factors, naturally, we're looking at things like sensitivity and specificity of the identified tests. And then in terms of organizational factors, we're looking at testing capacity, the time lag from referral to swab, and also the time lag from swab to results. In terms of the overall outputs of the model then, so I'll just present one of the results today. So this is plotting the person days spent in restricted movements versus infectious person days spent in the community. And the results here are per 1,000 close contacts. So as you can see, our current strategy in Ireland, so the bottom right, so S1, naturally associated with the lowest risk, but also a, a substantial enough burden. So in terms of the number of person days spent in restricted movements. As we move across, we can see that the scenarios that involved an RT-PCR test on day 10 were associated with, as expected, a small increase in the overall risk, but equally quite a large benefit in terms of the reduction in total person days spent in restricted movements. As we move across again, we can see the rapid antigen, again, a, smaller, a small increase in risk, and this would be because it's an instantaneous end uh, of your restriction of movement, so you get your result immediately, whereas with RT-PCR you have to wait a few days. And then as we can see, any of the scenarios that involved a test, set, a test on day seven naturally were associated with a large benefit in terms of the days in restricted movements, but equally with a marked increase in that overall risk. So again, the HICWA COVID-19 EAG were convened, and the general consensus this time was, should a change to the current strategy be implemented at a population level, the use of day zero and day 10 or TPC or tests may offer the most balanced alternative to the current testing regimen in terms of benefit and risk. And the EAG also applied a number of additional considerations that would need to be factored in. So this including people like healthcare workers and those caring for vulnerable groups. Equally trying to get a better understanding of the current adherence in Ireland to the duration of restriction of movements and what might influence this. Similarly, adherence to the current testing and strategy and factors that influence that. They highlighted the need for a clear communication strategy. So to highlight the rationale between the first and second tests and the importance of both tests, and also to consider what impact it might have on the current test and trace um, set up in Ireland. So again, we prepared our two reports um, for publication and then our formal advice to NEFIT. And the advice this time, so it's a bit longer, so you'll have to bear with me, but I've just flagged kind of the main things. So again, should a change to the current strategy be implemented of the options assessed at a population level, the use of the day zero and day 10 or TPCR tests with the end of restrictive movements on receipt of a not detected result from the day 10 test will present the largest incremental benefit and lowest incremental risk relative to the current standard of practice in Ireland. The day 10 test would be associated with an increased number of overall tests conducted. And again, that's because more people are becoming eligible for that second test. Consideration was required um, as to what constitutes an acceptable level of risk, so relative to current practice, particularly in the context of current and future disease trajectories. And when this piece of work was done, just know we were at quite a high level of community incidence overall. Attention needs to be paid to those potentially vulnerable groups or those working in high risk settings. And that urgent need for the communication strategy that clarifies the rationale for the first and second test. And naturally, any change that was implemented based on these modeling results would be contingent on completion of all testing requirements. So if an individual did not present for testing, then they should continue to restrict their movements for the full 14 day duration. So from the incubation period review. And I suppose overall, so taking both pieces of advice together, the policy decision by an effort was to not change the current strategy at present, um, but that is being kept under review. So I suppose moving on then to highlight some of the challenges, outputs and impact of our COVID-19 work to date. So I suppose it's always easy to start with the challenges. And um, so as we've flagged, we have tight timelines. So it's typically three to four weeks between the policy question and the advice. And as Kieran highlighted, this can be shorter again if there's a very pre pressing policy decision to be made. However, what does help and facilitate with this is having a very large, knowledgeable and supportive team around us. <clears throat> 
In terms of the volume of literature, as Kieran flagged, so initially, naturally, there was literally none. And now we're up to over 80,000 articles in PubMed alone. So with that respect to that, we need to be very careful about getting our searches as sensitive and specific as possible. Um, and also watching the scope of our questions and ensuring we have adequate time to answer. Again, the use of preprints as Kieran has flagged and that paper that Barbara Klein, our colleague, is working on at the moment. We were also faced with some challenges around the quality appraisal. So for example, we identified no formal tool for the assessment of case series, which are very dominant in the COVID-19 literature. We actually had to come up with our own de novo tool for that. In terms of formulating the advice, sometimes we're faced with low quality evidence, very complex data and things that have conflicting findings or perspectives. But I suppose always important to remember that a decision still has to be made and advice needs to be given. So I suppose formulating that advice in the context of these considerations. And lastly then, I suppose our work has generated a lot of media and public interest, which is great. So it's great to see it being disseminated widely, but this brings an accompanying need for very clear messaging and very clear key points that can be easily understood and stand alone. In terms of our outputs to date then from the COVID-19 work, and um, so as Kieran said, typically our outputs will reflect whatever is best um, appropriate to answer a policy question. Um, so in that vein, to date, uh, we've published 21 evidence summaries. So that would be like your rapid reviews of the research evidence, seven pieces of advice to NEFIT with another two soon to be published, two rapid HTAs, seven reviews of international guidance, two scoping reports with a third being published soon, five reviews of care pathways, so specifically acute care, two analysis or models, and two databases with the first one there, so the database of public health guidance being consistently updated since the very start of the um, pandemic work. In terms of academic publications, we've also managed a couple of those. Um, so we've had seven to date, and there's a few more currently under review or in preparation. And I suppose that's a real testament to the team. Um, so to move it again, dissemination to another audience and keeping it as broad as we possibly can. In terms of the overall impact that we've had then, um, so we just have some kind of news headlines and news outlets that we featured in. So for example, Kieran, as Kieran noted, the self-isolation period reduced to 10 days. Equally, the restriction of movement period did not change um, due to the residual risk. So also very important. Uh, it was flagged that reinfection, although rarely documented, is possible and that will have some implications for future considerations around immunity, possibly. The use of temperature screening and the settings in which they're used. The change in the testing of children's strategy to use nasal swabs instead of nasopharyngeal and also saliva currently being validated. The advice surrounding high risk settings and potential areas where we might see a greater risk of transmission overall. So particularly important coming into the festive season. And then some headlines, I suppose, are a little more direct. Um, so just party poopers, leave it at that. And that's our head of directorate, Maureen, there. Some additional impact then, I suppose, that might you know, not make headlines as much or be seen on social media, but important to flag. So particularly that database and the work that goes on behind the scenes for the public health guidance. Um, so that's been used to inform a huge number of policy questions. It's constantly being updated and it's a huge body of work and really impressive and a testament to the team members that work on that explicitly. Our academic publications have had some impact. Um, so this was actually a paper that Kieran uh, was the lead author on, so I'd be delighted I put this up. Um, but that had quite a large impact and also trended in Peru at one stage. Our social media engagement has increased and our reach is continuously increasing. And one of our team members, Melissa, is actually currently conducting a content analysis on this. So that'll be interesting to see. We've collaborated with uh, colleagues in the ECDC and share our work with them and to help inform recommendations that they're producing. We've informed some work done within the Special Committee on COVID-19 response. Equally, some of our work has been used by the HSE, so particularly around the acute care pathways and the resumption of acute care. It's given us lots of opportunities within our team ourselves um, to improve our processes, refine our quality assurance, ensure we're covering all our bases, and also for our own professional development. And I suppose lastly then, uh, the main impact and the positive impact that we hope we're having um, is on the population health within Ireland, particularly as we're trying to navigate this very difficult time. 
I suppose just to finish up, if anyone would like more information or to read more of the publications that we have, if you go on to hikwa.ie, you'll see a yellow banner. And if you just click on that, it'll bring you to this landing page here. Um, and I suppose just to note as well, our team are expanding um, in the very near future. Um, so if that's something that you would be interested in, please do keep an eye on the website. Um, and equally, if you'd like to know anything more about what it's like to work on the team, um, feel free to drop myself a Kieran line and we'd be happy to chat a bit more. So thank you very much for listening. Kieran and Laura, thank you both so very much for really informing.